three different files for chapter three. But we had pretty much gone through the assets and liabilities discussion. Now this is going to start. Do I have anything that's going to work right? Okay, so let's talk about stockholders' equity, and uh, we sort of had alluded to this uh, when we were doing our little review of the uh, different elements of the financial statements when we were doing our little magnet thing up here. I just want to make sure this thing is recording. Yes, it is. Okay, and so um, when we talk about the owner's equity section of the balance sheet. We're talking about our common stock essentially and in there we would have to disclose par value of the stock and the number of shares authorized, issued, and outstanding. Authorized, issued, and outstanding. And let's make sure we're comfortable uh, with what that's all about. So let's say I go ahead and I incorporate state of California, whatever. They'll authorize me the maximum number of shares that I could issue. Okay, so let's say that our shares authorized were 10,000. Okay, then when a company goes out and repurchases its own stock in the open market, can a company do that? I'm Tesla, I go out and I buy my own stock. What happened? Yikes, okay. You okay? Maybe someone else can take some notes for you or something? Okay, all right. Okay, so we have the number of shares authorized 10,000. Okay, then what? Then we go out and we buy our own stock in the open market. A company can do that. And let's say, um, well, I have authorized 10,000, but let's say I've issued 8,000 shares. I don't have to issue every single share I'm authorized, right? I can hold back on that. I don't have to issue every single share. But let's say that I go out and repurchase my own stock in the open market. We call that treasury stock. And let's say I go back and I reacquire, and I'm making these numbers up, guys, obviously, a thousand shares of my own stock. We call that treasury stock. We would subtract that off of the number of shares that have been uh, issued. And so my outstanding shares in this example would be 7,000. So you take your what? Your number of shares issued, you subtract off any treasury stock, that's stock you've reacquired of your own company in your open market. And the difference is considered what? Is considered the outstanding shares. And in our statement of stockholders' equity, uh, part of our stockholders' equity, part of our balance sheet, I should say, we would literally have to say these are the number of shares authorized, these are the number of shares issued, these are the number of shares outstanding. Now, treasury stock is something that is shown in the stockholders' equity section as a subtract from my overall stockholders equity and we really get more into that in chat uh, in intermediate too okay but just uh, understand how to calculate the number of shares outstanding okay now we also will report additional paid in capital and i think we kind of reviewed that a couple of classes ago this par of the stock is ten dollars the stock issues for I'm just making the numbers up 15 the additional paid in capital would be what the five dollars per share and we would show that down in the uh, stockholders equity section retained earnings is going to be the beginning re uh, the retained earnings since the beginning of the company minus any dividends is what our balance of retained earnings is going to be and I think last time we talked about retained earnings being authorized versus uh, I shouldn't say authorized, appropriated versus unappropriated. If it's appropriated, it's set aside for some purpose, right? Unappropriated typically indicates to the stockholders, hey, this could be very well available for dividends at some point. Okay, okay good. So that's our owner's equity. Um, and we talked about treasury stock 
Uh, other comprehensive income from previous years, we talked about that last time. The correct title for that is what? The accumulated other comprehensive income. It's like the retained earnings of our comprehensive income. And we went through that, and I think we even did a numeric example with how we would deal with uh, available for sale securities and how that would get the OCI. Okay, as I said, treasury stock reduction and stockholders in, uh, uh, interest, stockholders equity. Uh, stop uh, not controlling interest. They used to call it minority interest, so I got the repair. Let's say that um, I have a, uh, a consolidated company and I acquire 90% of the stock. Uh, I have a company, I acquire 90% of the stock of another company. I'm going to want to show the consolidated interest of those two companies, but that would mean that there's a what? 10% interest in that somebody else holds. In the stockholders equity section, I would have to partition out that portion of the company that is held by non-controlling interest. Okay, So you would literally see a line item for non-controlling interest before we get to the total stockholders equity. That's representing the percentage of the company that are owned by uh, other, of another company that are owned by other individuals. I'm not doing the best job explaining that. So what happens? Company A does what? Acquires company B. Now if they acquire what? A hundred percent, then we'll simply consolidate and there'll be no control non-controlling interest. But I don't have to acquire a hundred percent to consolidate. All I have to acquire is fifty-one percent, right? So let's say instead of acquiring 100% I acquire 90% of company. <coughs> when I get to the stockholders equity, I will show 100% of the equity of company uh, B that I have acquired. Okay? And of course I'm also showing my own stock holders that we have consolidated the two, right? And then there'll be a non-controlling interest, we used to call it minority interest. There'll be a non-controlling interest part that will show as uh, the, the portion that is owned by, owned by the other 10%, uh, whatever it is. And so they show 10% non-controlling interest that would be backed out of the stockholders equity section so that now when we show the bottom line, uh, we're showing what? We're showing the 90% that we owe as the bottom line. And we would subtract out that not controlling interest. And that appears in the stockholders equity section. Okay, but these are other owners of the subsidiary that we've consolidated in with our company. Okay, so you can see, um, how uh, if they've done this, let's say they subtract it out, I guess we add in, you know, we add in the non-controlling interest. So I guess we show 90%, we consolidate 90% of everything, and then we add in the non-controlling interest, subtract it out. I was thinking of how we report net income. Net income we subtract out the non-controlling interest part. In the stockholders equity section, we're going to uh, show that non-controlling interest added in. So this would all be 90%, and then we add in the non-controlling interest. So you can see equity section, preferred stock, common stock, paying capital in excess of par, the accumulated other comprehensive income like we talked last time, the retained earnings, of course, is going to be there, which is going to be the accumulation of the uh, income minus dividend. That gives us the total stockholders' equity portion that uh, we own, and then we don't subtract out the non-controlling interest, we add it in. Okay, so this is all the 90% share, and this is just showing the equity that's owned by others other than the uh, controlling company. Okay. Okay, good. Supplemental disclosures. Any questions on that? On stockholders' equity? Supplemental. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, on the income statement uh, presentation. I've got a pretty decent presentation of that non-controlling interest would look. I just gotta find it.
I don't think you guys mind if I steal from other sources, right? Do you guys mind if I steal something from mm -hmm. from somewhere else? <laughs> okay, so I'll just show you right here. Where is it? This way. Actually, they didn't have it either. No, I had looked up at one point how non controlling interest would look. Okay. So, um, Okay, so this is the consolidated balance sheet, and you see how um, they add in the non-controlling interest, like what we saw in the example of the textbook. Okay, where I got myself a little twisted was, um, you know, this is really a consolidation issue, which is beyond the scope of this class, guys. So I apologize for getting myself a little twisted on that, and that what you do, I was putting it through the balance sheet, but I was really thinking income statement. You show net income 100%, and then you back out the portion of the non-controlling interest net income, and then um, you report the net income attributed to the solid income, which is what I was doing over here, thinking incorrectly about the balance sheet. It's the income statement that does that. For the uh, balance sheet, you report your share of the subsidiary, whatever it is, 90%, and then you add in the non-controlling interest to get the bottom line of stockholders' equity. For net income, you show the net income 100%, and then you back out the non-controlling interest on the income statement. Okay. So, beyond the scope of this I'm class, I'm not going to be asking you, to, you know, questions about how to deal with non-controlling interest. That's a, a uh, consolid. That's an advanced accounting issue. Okay. Question on that? Okay. All right, good. So let's go back over to the supplemental disclosures. Okay, now this gets a little bit uh, twisted in here and that we're calling the supplemental disclosures. Um, there are required disclosures. What's the problem with you? Is it me? Yes, it is. That's the only one of them. There are required disclosures that a company has to provide, and that's what we're talking about here. Now, there are also supplemental disclosures that companies provide as part of their SEC filings that are not part of the basic financial statements. So, FASB calls out things that need to be disclosed. Then SEC comes in behind and says, these are things that you have to include in your um, in your 10k disclosures and we kind of have them mixed up a little bit on this slide so I'll go ahead and indicate whether they are FASB issue or whether they are a SEC supplemental disclosure so summary of significant accounting policy is usually the first or second footnote that FASB asked for Okay, 
summary of significant accounting policies is usually the first or second footnote. And uh, sir, you had asked a question the other day. I think we were talking about uh, disclosures regarding tax equivalents. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you said, well, where would you describe what are tax equivalents? That's the kind of thing you could probably put in the first or second footnote, summary of significant accounting policies. Okay, subsequent events are a required FASB disclosure. Subsequent event is basically something that happens um, after the balance sheet date, but before the financial statements are issued. There's a requirement that management stay vigilant, aware of those things, and properly disclose those in the financial statements, and that's a FASB footnote disclosure. Noteworthy transactions and events. Okay, that's his footnote. Noteworthy tra transactions and event is a FASB disclosure issue. Okay. MDNA. Okay, this is SEC. When you file your 10K report, SEC requires that as part of that 10K information that you provide a management discussion and analysis. MDNA is not the company sitting there saying, oh, what a beautiful company we have, look at how shiny our building is. It's not that kind of thing. It's a financial document. So it accompanies the financial statements, it supplements the financial uh, statements, and it's talking about financial aspects of this company's operation. It'll often contain condensed financial information, et cetera, in there. We, so we don't you know, rehash regurgitate the whole financial statement, for lack of a better term, into the MDNA, but we do lift pieces of the financial reports and put that in the MD MDNA, okay? Management's responsibility is really something that is um, supplemental, okay, in that management will acknowledge its responsibility for the financial statements, FS. Okay, I'm, I'm not putting up with this. I don't know what's going on with this thing, so I'm just going to get into uh, do it like this. Okay, management's responsibility is supplemental. And it deals with <coughs> um, management's responsibility for the financial statements and internal control. Okay, so management has to provide as part of their SEC filing, so it's an SEC requirement, SEC supplemental requirement, they have to provide information saying that they are responsible for the financial statements, they are responsible for the internal control, and they literally have to sign off on that, and that's part of, a re uh, part of the reports that go along with the entire SEC filing. Same thing with the auditor's report that is supplemental to the financial statements. It is not part of the financial statements. It is not a note. That is a SEC requirement that you have the financial report, the auditor's report going with the financial statements. Compensation of executive and directors, that is also SEC requirements. Okay, so summary significant accounting policies, that's FASB, that's part of the financial statements, I'm going to write that again. Subsequent events, that's FASB, that's a note to the financial statements. Uh, noteworthy transaction and events, that's FASB, that's a note to the financial statements. When you get to management discussion analysis, I'll write it over here, that's who? SEC, that's supplemental, okay? So these things that SEC requires are supplemental to the financial things. Let me draw you even a better picture of that. So here's the financial statements. Here's the supplemental information. Okay, here's the, here's the supplemental information. It's right next to the financial statements, isn't it? Okay, so you've got your financial statements, and that includes the notes, guys. 
notes are considered part of the financial statements, right? And then you've got all this other stuff sort of orbiting around the financial statement, the MDNA, management's responsibility and the report that they provide, auditor's report, and information like compensation. That's all part of the SEC file. Now, um, what's interesting though is the auditor's report covers the financial statements. So even though the auditor's report is sort of supplemental to the financial statements and belongs to the auditor, it is talking about the what? The financial statements. Remember we looked at uh, Apple's report and EY's report on Apple before? So they don't really audit the supplemental information. All auditors are required to do is look at the supplemental information and make sure it's consistent with the financial reports. So if there was a table in there that was drawn from the financial reports, the auditors would look at that and make sure that what? there wasn't some sort of inconsistency between the financial statements and the condensed information that's maybe in the MDNA. Okay? All right. So let's take a look at uh, the accounting policy, summary significant accounting policy, depreciation methods. What are we using? We're we using straight line. We're using declining balance. What? Inventory valuation. Okay? Lower of cost or market, are we using LIFO, FIFO, weighted average assumptions, fair value options, remember we said for our held to maturity securities we could use what? We could use the, um, not for held to maturity, but for our available for sale, we could use the fair value option in which we'll run gains and losses not through OCI but through the net income, through the income statement, okay, etc. Okay, revenue recognition, Again, cash, cash equivalents. This is not an exhaustive list, right? But it's the idea of the significant accounting policies that we'd be talking about. Okay, subsequent events. So what happens here? Let's say my financial reports go from 1118 to 123118. Okay, and let's say that um, on, I don't know, making a date up, January 23rd, 2019, I have a plant, a factory, blows up. Twenty nineteen. January twenty third, twenty nineteen, the factory blows up. My financial reports go from January first, twenty eighteen to December thirty first, twenty eighteen. Okay, and on one twenty three, twenty nineteen, which is the next year, a plant blows up, right? Now I issue my financial statements on again making the numbers up. February 27th, 2019, okay? Even though the year ends 12 31, 2019, they're not sitting there waiting for the clock to strike 12 and they issue the financial statements. There's some period of time as they wrap them up and they don't issue them until uh, February 2019. How should I treat this fact that the plant blew up and it blew up in the next year, didn't it? I mean, it's going to be a hole in the ground in 2019, right? So shall, how should I handle this fact that the plant blew up? Huh? Good. I'm going to have to disclose that in my notes. That the plant blew up? I'm to disclose that in the notes that the plant blew up because what? because it was before I issued my financial statements, right? Okay. So the subsequent period in this little example is what? 123118 to 227 2019 
And we have to continue to be aware of those things and disclose about those things in the financial reports all the way up till we finally issue the financial statements, right? Now what happens if a plant blows up on March 23rd? We're not required to sit there and do what? Reissue the financial statements or anything. That happened after the subsequent period, right? So we have to keep you monitoring for those things in the subsequent period. Okay, good. With me so far? Okay. Now, I should disclose what? Financial impact, yeah. Where I put my disclose and notes. And I should disclose what? The financial impact? Now, does it have to be the exact amount of the financial impact? Maybe at this point I can only disclose what? A range or a best estimate of a middle amount, whatever. Okay, so you don't have to sit here and nail this exactly. You just do your best to give the best estimate you can. Okay, and if you can't give an estimate, you, you give a range. Okay, now let me ask you a different scenario. Come on. Let's say I can erase this now. I don't want to squeeze these things in. Maybe I can just squeeze it right here. Let's say I have a lawsuit that is in progress at twelve thirty one eighteen. And then I settle lawsuit on one twenty three twenty nineteen. And I have a loss on that, say, making it up, guys, a million dollars. Now, what do I do? Well, I don't know, redo, but I certainly have to book that in the financials, right? Okay. And so what's going to happen? I'm literally going to have to debit loss for a million, loss on lawsuit or whatever, and credit what? And assuming I haven't, I obviously hadn't paid them before the year was up, before December 31st was up, because we didn't know what the settlement was until March, right? So I would credit a liability for a million dollars because even though I may pay them in January, that payment's in the next year. So my 2019 statements, I'm going to debit liability credit cash, right? But at 2018, I'm going to have to book the liability, right? Now that's because what? The conditions that led to that loss that we discovered in the subsequent period existed at the balance sheet, didn't it? So since that conditions exist on the balance sheet, you have to book it. How would that work for some of the bigger losses that last stretch out over four or five years? Uh, if it's unsettled, okay, in those earlier years, then we're back to the disclosure issue where, uh, well, let me back up. Um, assuming we don't know, we don't have an estimate of a potential loss, so we would go ahead and disclose. Okay? But if we have an estimate of potential losses, we would be required to take that estimate. Okay, so it really depends. Okay, you take contingent losses when they're probable and estimable. So it would depend on the probability and the estimability of them. So in this situation, you just go back and two months ago and did you work to them with some fairly easy? Yeah. And you wouldn't have to go back, okay, well, the lawsuit was filed in 2014. Oh, no. Does not require a statement of the that was like a pretty sort of second. Well, if you had already accrued amount, then you would go ahead and you know take the difference at that point in time. You'd probably put no disclosed and now there's been a final settlement or whatever. Um, if you had taken losses that were in excess of the actual amount of loss in previous period, you could actually book a gain. Because that's called a change in accounting estimate, and you simply go forward with the new estimate. You don't go back and restate statements for change in estimate. You spend the whole life restating statements. Yeah. So you just 
take the loss if you think you have a good estimate and then you just go forward period after period. And at the end, the settlement is less, oh well, we're going to go ahead and take a gain in those previous periods, uh, periods for the, the adjustment for thinking that we had a loss and we did. Okay? Now let me ask you this. What happens if I have a client's uh, I guess I, I gotta not get an audit what happens if I have a situation where I have a um, major customer and my customer declares bankruptcy on January 23rd? So we're past December 31st, 2018, right? And I learn about the bankruptcy in January of 2019. What should I do? Okay, and thank you for falling into the trap that I set up for you so we all learn from that. So thank you very much. Even though that sounds like it's a subsequent event that occurred after the balance sheet date it should only be disclosed, the standards are very specific about that. Basby comes out and says the conditions that gave rise to that bankruptcy didn't just come up in January. They were already in effect or in the process, you know, whatever word you want to use for that, at December 31st. And so you would literally have to sit there and debit your allowance, credit your account receivable to write that off, and potentially that debit to the allowance is going to what? Lower the allowance, so you may even want to do what? Take more bad debt expense and credit the allowance to replenish it for any amount you're taking out to do this write off which you didn't find out about until the subsequent period. So you book that one. Okay. So that's sort of the nuance and the standards that I want to point out there because I mean put a question on your exam to try to trick you into that one. Now you won't fall into it, right? Okay. Question? If if okay, so they tell me they went bankrupt December whatever, okay, so I mean they tell me they went bankrupt, I should say in January, I should say, on January 23rd, so we book it, and I'll show you the whole set of potential journal entries there by inserting a new slide, okay, just so I have some room, okay, and I'm doing it here rather than on the board so that you guys can see it later, but because I had to have to book that write-off, I would go ahead and I would, in my 2018 statements now, right, I would make an entry that affects my 2018 statements here. I would debit the allowance, just making a number up. I'm going to say the bankruptcy made me write off an account receivable of 75000 I would credit the account receivable, wouldn't I? With me so far? Now, when I credit the account receivable and debit the allowance, and when I debit the allowance, more specifically, I may look at the allowance at this point and say, I don't have enough in the allowance. Now the allowance is too low because remember I'm putting allowance in there not just for this one loan, but other loans, et cetera, or maybe the fact that this customer went bankrupt makes me uh, realize that I have what? That I have other customers that may also be affected by the same economic downturn that's caused me to want to put a mouth in this allowance. When you put amounts into the allowance, when you put amounts in the allowance, you have to consider not only your homogeneous loans, not only homogeneous loans like credit card loans, not only your specific loans like your say commercial real estate loans, but FASB also requires that you consider economic factors. So when I learn that this company is going bankrupt, I may one of my customers is going bankrupt, I may say, hey, that same economic issue is going to affect my other customers. Whatever it's very likely that I would decide to go ahead and put more into the allowance at that point, right? And if I want to put more into the allowance, I'm going to have to do what? I'm going to have to sit there and debit the bad debt expense, and I'm just making this number up. Let's say I decide, you know what? I want 30000 more in there. And I credit the allowance for 30000 more to cover any additional losses that I think I might have at that point in time. Okay. The main takeaway here is what? 
financial statement adjustment for a circumstance like what I'm talking about, a, pay, a, a customer tells you they can't pay you in a subsequent period, it, it require, in the subsequent period it requires what? Journal entries, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so going back to the lawsuit example, yeah. um, would you, when you book it, would you date it on the 31st, the minimum loss? Well, the, since the effect is entirely a balance, um, uh, well, I guess it's not entirely a balance sheet effect because it has the loss on the income statement, but it would be as of the liability would be as of 1231, and the loss would have occurred during the period January 1st, 2018 to December 31st, 2018 on the income statement, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you mean dated? Or like, would you have to make a journal entry for that? Or? Yeah, I guess you could make the journal entry 12, 31, 18. Okay, I don't see that it has any impact on how it's dis how it's displayed in the financial statements. You would likely give the uh, date of the settlement and whatnot in a footnote. Okay. Yeah. And there's no date. You yeah. don't list transactions by date. But I guess in a general ledger, you could date it any way, you, any date you want. So maybe 12, 31. Okay, all right, good. Now you come over and noteworthy events, uh, related party transactions. Is it okay to have a related party transaction? What is a related party transaction? A related party transaction is a transaction that a company has with a related party. For example, it does what? It loans money to one of its officers, one of its corporate officers. It borrows money from a corporate officer. It has a transaction with some sort of subsidiary or something. Okay, are these things okay? Is it okay to do this? It's okay to do it, but it must be disclosed. If you have a related party transaction like that, it has to be disclosed. Same with the financial report. So you would probably have a note next to your note receivable and say, hey, 10,000 of this is no receivable with a corporate officer or something like that, and that has to be disclosed. Okay? Must be disclosed. Fraud, illegal acts have to be disclosed. I don't know where that's disclosed. Some sort of law, I guess, practices. Financial Corrupt Practices Act. What kind of payments? Grease payments to like who? Yeah. Uh, okay, but sometimes you get it, you get it. It's not fraud, it's not right, it's something. Uh, I, I don't know. Legal, but if it's legal, then it shouldn't be described as an illegal act. Okay, I mean, I think you're sitting here saying, well, hang on a minute, now how can we possibly, you know, have an illegal act and disclose it? Um, huh? Well, I could have an illegal act that I did accidentally. You will probably perform an illegal act accidentally today when you're driving home. Okay, so, you know, it's a question of whether you get caught or not. Not all illegal acts are, you know, punishable like that, you know, or jail or something. Hey, you know, um, we didn't know that we had inappropriately filed or uh, claimed our, uh, our customs duties. It was a very complicated process and we miscalculated and we <laughs> performed an illegal act by understating our duties or understating our duties on our inventory or something like that. And it could be significant because customs could look at that and they could say, well, look, since you underdeclared your duties by such a large amount, we automatically assume that that's some sort of fraud and now we're going to be taking you to court and we would want to state our case. Well, we didn't know, but we are being investigated by uh, customs at this point in time or, you know, maybe there's some sort of potential investigation for, uh, you know, if you have a product liability suit going on or an investigation by the federal government or something or they've declared that you've done an illegal act and you're still fighting it whatever so that's the nature of things you're talking about there fraud you sit there and you say well geez 
you know, I've committed fraud, and then I'm going to go and say, hey, everybody, guess what? There's fraud in these here financial statements. You know, good luck finding it or something. Um, that could be what? Employee fraud. So I could have a situation where my employees have embezzled certain amounts from the company or something. And maybe I'm in a position right now where I don't really know the dollar amounts associated with those because we're still trying to figure it out, et cetera. There would be an expectation that that would be fully disclosed in the financial report. Okay. Now, uh, again, this is not an auditing class, but these are the types of things that we call um, emphasis of matter. Okay, I'm thinking if I'm an auditor and I've got companies lurking around with this kind of stuff in the footnotes, I will also add that to my audit report because I want to make sure that my readers of the financial statements and the readers of my report are directed to the footnote that we talk about these kind of significant things. I could do the same thing with related party transactions as well. I am allowed to emphasize anything I want in my auditor's report that is included in the financial statements. And if they don't include it in the financial statements, I'm also allowed to uh, have what they call an other matter. Other matters is things that aren't disclosed in financial statements that I as auditor have determined need to be in there, and I can stick those things in the financial reports as well. Okay. I mean, not in the financial reports because there's management, but in the auditor's reports. Okay, MDNA is part of the SEC filing. Talked about trends, significant events, etc. It is not part of the financial reports, guys. It is supplemental to the financial reports. It's not in the footnotes. It is a supplemental document. Remember the box I put around the financial statement? But it does talk about financial aspects. And again, I don't want to turn this into an auditing class. The auditors um, are required, as I've already said, to make sure that there's not a material inconsistency between the supplemental information like the MDNA and the financial statements. But the audit opinion only covers what? Only covers the financial statement. Management's responsibility, okay? Management has to provide a report that accompanies the financial statements. It is supplemental to the financial statements, but it accompanies the financial statements stating their responsibility for not only the financial statements, but also the internal control. Okay, and they have to provide that report. And then the auditors come behind and see if they are satisfied with how management has reported their responsibility to the internal control. But management has to have that as part of the financial reporting package that they send up to SEC. Auditor's report belongs to the auditor, but it does have to be filed with the financial statements with the SEC, so they accompany each other. Okay, and the auditor will give their uh, report there. They talk about the different types of reports here, guys. I'm not going to get into that. That's an auditing class, okay? I say that, and then let me tell you what, I, what they're talking about here. If I find a problem with the financial statements, I am required to modify my report. So my report can be unmodified, or my report can be modified. If I'm happy with the financial statements, my report is unmodified. The one that we looked at at Apple, that was an unmodified report. In our opinion, the financial statements were fairly stated and everybody was happy. But if there are some problems, then I can start to modify my report for material um, um, misstatements in the financial reports. And if I really don't like the financial report, I could give an adverse opinion. Adverse opinion says there are so many problems with these financial statements, you cannot rely on them for making investment and credit decisions. Okay. So that's sort of, there's other types of issues that can impact the report. There's also, I'll go, I'll do the one more. I'll try not to turn this into an audio discussion, but uh, there's also something called a, an, uh, a, uh, a disclaimer of opinion. With disclaimer of opinion, the auditor decides not to even give an opinion on the financial statements. And that's because the scope of the audit is so significantly limited that the auditor just throws up their hands and says, I'm not giving a report on these financial statements. I'm disclaiming an opinion. Okay? But uh, the audit report, the main thing you need to know is that it is supplemental to the financial statements. Okay? So what are the types of reports So, I'm just talking up here just in case, right? What are the type of reports here? What are the type of reports you see in the world? Um, 
unmodified if everything's good, right? Or you could give what? Modified would be to qualify or adverse, right? And you could also do a misclaim and do that still stuff. Okay, good. All right, good. So here they are. My help is unqualified. Unqualified is the name of the report if you're following public company requirements. Unmodified is for public company, uh, non-public companies. Unqualified, unqualified is for public companies. Um, no, they've changed that now. So they're all unmodified now. So this slide's not correct. They're all what? Unmodified now if you think everything's okay, not unqualified. Qualified, adverse, and then you can also have disclaimer. So this should say unmodified. So it's unmodified, Correct. This should say unmodified. Let me fix that. Sometimes the books have trouble keeping up with areas that aren't their area. Mm -hmm. Unmodified. Yeah, uh, it used to be that the, what I had said that the public companies use the word unqualified, but now they've also changed that and they're using the word unmodified as well. Qualified and adverse and disclaimers are modifications. So unmodified is meaning not qualified, not adverse, not disclaimer. And unmodified means that it's clean. No. Um, like all dogs, all poodles are dogs, but not all dogs are poodles kind of thing. So, so what I'm saying here is these are all considered modifications. So these are all modified. When it's clean, it's unmodified. The rest of these are modified, right? The modification being that we've qualified, we've disclaimed, or we've adverse. Okay? Nothing we're going to talk I'm not testing you on this. This is an audio. Huh? No. No, no, no. No. This is when I, when my, well, okay, let me give you an example. Go back to that write off mm -hmm. that we talked about. Let's say I'm auditing a company and I believe they should write off some loans right. and they don't do it. Okay, now let's say I look at that and I think that that is material. Mm -hmm. Then I would write my opinion that would say um, basis for qualification. And I would say the company did not write off certain loans that I felt they should write off. And when I get down to the opinion, I'd say, in my opinion, except for the effect of the non-write off of the loans, the financial statements are fairly stated. Now that's still a very material item that I'm calling out there. And I'm not talking about immaterial, but it's not significant enough that I go all the way to adverse. If I go to adverse, then I'm saying, and, and, and if it was a really big loan, or there was a bunch of mistakes that they made, then if I go to adverse, I'll say, uh, basis for my adverse opinion, I'll put all my complaints, and I'll say, because of, which is a much more pointing word, phrase, because of the effects of all of those things, the financial statements cannot be relied upon. That's adverse. And it just depends on the degree and the materiality of the problem you have. With and so far. Now let's say I give that qualification that I described to you, except for qualification. I go away, and then a little bit while, a little bit later, management calls me and says, hey, guess what, auditor? Guess what, John? We've taken a better look at that write-off you wanted us to do, and now we think we've got the support for what the amount of the write-off is. Because sometimes you might come up with something like that and you just can't agree as to what the appropriate amount of write-off is, et cetera, right? So they come up with the evidence and they show me that this was the amount that they wanted to write off. At that point, I'll reissue my audit report, this time being um, unmodified. All I'll have to do is call out that I had had a 
previous opinion that I'm now changing. So you can change your opinion if circumstances come to light later. Okay. Um, but in this case, um, you know, I'd issue one of these. Okay, disclaimer. Interesting. The uh, federal government gets a disclaimer on their financial statements every year, which means that my former office, the GAO, we decline to give them an opinion on their financial statements every year. The reason being that they cannot, um, did I say my office? My former office, I don't work there anymore. Um, I guess I always consider it part of the we, I guess. But um, what happens? The reason we do that, one, they cannot get an audit on Department of Defense. And if you can't audit a major subsidiary of a consolidated financial statements, that disclaimer on the subsidiary often bubbles up in a disclaimer on the consolidated statements. And um, we disclaim because nobody audits Department of Defense. They can't get a clean opinion on Department of the Defense. Why not? Right? That's what you would want to believe. That's not the case, okay? <laughs> Department of Defense is good at blowing up other people's assets, but as far as knowing where their assets are, they're not very good at that. And so if we can't locate their assets, we, they can't look at them. They disclaim an opinion of Department of Defense. That boils up into a disclaimer on the consolidated. The other problem is, is that the federal government's consolidated financial, uh, consolidated balance sheet doesn't balance. There's like a three or four trillion dollar plug they have to put on it every year to make it balance. And the reason they have to do that is because they have 32 agencies. You've seen, if you're watching anything that's going on in Washington right now, the main word that should be coming out to you is, man, they're screwed up over there. They left hand, they don't like the right hand and won't talk to it, right? And so what happens? They have 32 agencies that make up the consolidation and those 32 agencies all have their individual accounting systems and then they have a consolidated system up here. They prepare the consolidated statements up here and then they try to back in to the individual statements and guess what? It never works, of course. That's not how you build a consolidation. You start from the bottom, eliminate up, but they can't do that because the systems aren't all, they're all 32 different systems. So when you have to plug 32, uh, you know, 3.2, 3.4 trillion, four trillion dollars on a financial reports every year, that's the kind of thing that leads auditors to what? We disclaim an opinion. We can't tell you whether or not the financial statements are fairly stated. So that's the kind of big stuff that leads to a disclaimer. Okay, all right, beyond what we're trying to talk about here. Compensation, uh, you know, in the SEC filings, they have to say how much the CEO makes, CFO makes, stuff like that. Um, that's part of my opinion uh, why the NFL decided to uh, not be a, uh, not be a uh, public, not, they, were a, they were a not-for-profit entity and not-for-profit entities are supposed to disclose compensation and then recently they said, okay, we're not going to make ourselves a not-for-profit entity anymore because they didn't want to disclose the salaries of all the big, you know, big wigs in the NFL and stuff. And it's not, a, it's an, it's, NFL is not a public company, it's a, it's a, uh, what do you call that, cooperative. Um, so it's not even considered a, a public company. Okay. Contractual situations, you uh, would want to disclose those as well. Okay, uh, some basic ratios here, guys. Current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. I think you knew that when you walked in here today, right? You could also have something called the acid test ratio, and what it does is it backs out the inventory as part of the calculation of the. Uh, of the Scott Steel current liabilities, but now we back out current asset, uh, less inventory, and we probably should put prepaids in here as well. They didn't mention it, but you'd also want to back out your prepaids, okay? Because you may not, you're not going to be able to liquidate your prepaids very well, are you? Okay, you can't liquidate those in the cash. It, what we're trying to see is, do we have the what? Do we have the current assets available to what? pay off current liabilities that are coming due. Inventory, maybe you got a bunch of obsolete inventory. 
So we're going to back that out and give a more severe test of our uh, solvency by, um, by backing out certain a assets. Debt to equity, total liability to stockholders' equity. I mean, has there ever been a name of something that's more descriptive of what they want you to do? Debt to equity. Okay, so that one's pretty easy. Okay. Uh, times interest earned, you take your net income plus your interest expense plus your income taxes and divide that by the interest expense and return on equity. Okay. For this chapter, guys, right here, okay. These are the two that I probably will ask you about. Some of these other ones will come up in later chapters. Okay. All right, good. Let's take the time we have left and see if we can't knock out that quiz so we hit uh, next time clean into chapter four. A couple of these I think we've looked at already. Okay. So let's take a look at number one here, an asset that is generally not expected to be converted into cash or consumed with one year or the operating cycle typically is a what non-current asset and so that would typically be a building okay, unless it's a gingerbread house or something I guess but you probably won't consume that within one year right. Okay, which is a shareholder's equity account in the balance sheet? Paid in capital. This is sort of the magnet game all over again, isn't it? Number three, rent collected in advance is an ass is a huh? Oh, I see. If you've collected it, if you paid it in advance, it's an asset, right? But if you collect it in advance, you debit cash, credit, unearned rent revenue. I see. Number four, notes payable that are due in two years are long-term liabilities using our rule of thumb of one year for current items. Number five, which of the following is not a current liability and uh, prepaid rent we've decided is an asset, isn't it? So prepaid rent is an asset. Uh, what? Unearned rent is a liability, right? Number six, we did this one together. New Oaks Winery requires two months, and we go past the what? Past the one year is the main takeaway here. Yeah. Uh, no payable in two years would be uh, non-current here because the operating cycle is longer than. Well, whatever it is, two years would be 20, what was it here, 30 months? Yeah. So it would be longer, it would be not considered non-current because it's the operating cycle, it's whichever longer, okay, one year or the uh, operating cycle, whichever is longer. Number seven, long-term assets generally include land. The rest of these are all what? Clearly current, okay. All right, so then we get to play with this with some numbers, and they want us to pick out the ones that are, what do they want here? Current assets. Okay, so let's do this. How about accounts receivable? Is that current? Okay, good. 730. How about uh, building? No. How about cash? Yeah. How about interest receivable? Yeah, looks like it's interest receivable. How about land? Did we pick up inventory? How much? Not yet. How much is the? Which one's the inventory here? It's kind of hard to read this thing. The inventory is sixteen. Guys, you can probably see it easier on yours. Yeah, sixteen. Okay. Uh, how about uh, notes receivable long term? Thank you, God. Okay. How about petty cash? Yes, we're gonna pick that up. What's that? Five. How about supplies? Supplies is, how about a trademark? How much, which one is prepaid rent? The prepaid rent is 20? Supplies is eight? Okay. This is a funky presentation of this. Okay, how about, um, where are we, trademark? 
trademark is not. Accounts payable trade is a liability. Accumulated depreciation, additional paid in capital is what? Is stockholders equity. How about allowance? What do you want to do with the allowance? We need to subtract it, don't we? So I'll put that up next to the receivable. How about um, cash dividend is a liability, common stock is common stock, tax payable, notes payable, retained earnings, deferred revenues. That looks like everything, doesn't it? Okay, so is that what they gave us down here? 730 minus 20 plus what? 34 plus the 30. Looks like we got it right. Plus the 16 plus the 5 plus the 20. So what's the answer? 823? Okay. It's not too bad. Uh, stockholders equity. We can do that pretty quick. We have what? The common stock? Is it 15? How about retain earnings? Do they have an additional paid in capital? Yeah? 485? Okay, I think that's it, right? Okay, good. All right, guys, I'm not going to... You want to do the current liability one? Let's do it. Let's just look right here. Okay, so accounts payable is a current liability, right? The what? Salaries payable. Okay, note payable due 2019. Yeah, that's going to be what? Within a year? So we're going to pick that up. Okay, good. Number 11, disclosure note would not include... Um, depreciation methods, definition of cash equivalents, there's our cash equivalent definition, details of pension plans, sure, right, but uh, data to adjust financial statements so they are not misleading, just book the adjustment. You don't need to sit there and call out every adjustment you made to make the financial statements correct, right, okay, not in your, not in your uh, disclosures. Now, you would certainly want to report those if you're an auditor to your uh, board of directors, those charged with governance. Those do get reported so they understand this, the nature of adjustments that had to be made in order for the financial statements to be fairly stated. But uh, you don't put that as a disclosure in the financial statements. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Dexter Corp has a June 30th fiscal year and is planned to issue annual year three financial things by September 30th. On August 15th, a warehouse fire destroys an estimated $250,000 in inventory. As a, result, as, a result, as a result of the fire in its year three financial statements, recorded journal entry with disclosures. No, the plant didn't get destroyed until what? After the fiscal year end, it ended June 30th, and this plant didn't burn the warehouse and burn whatever until what? August of the next fiscal year, which began what? July 1st? Okay. Uh, how about disclose the nature of the event along with the estimated financial impact? Yes. Yeah, disclose and give that financial impact. That sounds right. Disclose the nature of the event with no estimated impact? Why? If you have that information, disclose it, right? How about the recorded journal entry? Again, it happened what? It happened after the fiscal year, right? So the answer here is B. Blah, blah. What do they want? Current ratio? Current assets divided by current liabilities, guys. Let's save ourselves the grief of going through and figure out the current assets here. I probably won't ask you much of these. We already did this, didn't we? cash and cash equivalent questions. So if you want to look back at that, that's in another lecture. And I think we did... That's it, right? Okay. All right, guys. We're going to hit it hard on uh, Wednesday. I really want to see how much damage we can do to Chapter 4 so we get a good coverage of Chapter 5 revenue recognition. All right? All right. I will see you on Wednesday. And I have to still post, an, oh, please sign in. And I have to post uh, the last two lectures, this one and the one before this. I'll get those up for you. All right, guys, I'll see you on Wednesday.